Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. All right. So Will Coleman is the CEO and founder of Alto, a new ride-sharing service based in Dallas, Texas, focused on redefining the ride-sharing experience. Will is a former partner at McKinsey & Company, where he led their B2C travel practice to build disruptive strategies into the marketplace. For more than 10 years, he has supported airline, hotel, and car rental clients on commercial and operation strategy development and implementation. Will is also a proud graduate of the University of Texas and a Dallas native. So I'm excited to chat. Will, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thanks, Harry. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you know, I think that this, uh, I, I refer to this as like an emergency episode since there's, there's a lot going on in the world right now and with coronavirus and all that. But I think you guys are taking a unique approach to it. So I'm uh, very eager and excited to chat. Thanks. Yeah, I actually have a podcast as well for all of our drivers at Alto, oh, cool. and uh, we've done a lot of them, a lot of emergency episodes over the course of the last few weeks. So uh, I'm quite used to that. Interesting. Yeah, you know, I think just totally off topic, but I've sort of been balancing the coronavirus content that we've been doing with just regular content and kind of pretending like that nothing is happening. Just since I feel people are so inundated. Um, so on the podcast, this is actually our first sort of real coronavirus episode. So I think I don't know if that's an honor or not, but uh, you're here and it's too late now. <laughs> Good. Well, I'm happy to be here. Cool. So before we dig into uh, everything that's going on right now, can you give me the sort of 90 second pitch for Alto? What makes the company so unique? And, uh, you know, anything else you want to share? Yeah, absolutely. We started Alto about uh, just over a year, a year and a half mm -hmm. ago. And the original premise behind uh, our company was uh, that we wanted to elevate the experience in rideshare for both passengers and drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to create a safer, more consistent, higher quality experience for our uh, passengers and a safer, more consistent, higher quality experience for our drivers. And so we really uh, founded the company with the idea that we could uh, create that better experience for passengers and for drivers by doing things very much differently than the major competitors in the space. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we, in order to do that, we needed to uh, really totally rethink the business model to have control over the passenger experience. We see ourselves as a service company, not a technology company. And so our product is a ride. Mm -hmm. It's the actual experience in our car. Uh, we obviously use an app and, and for our drivers and for our customers yeah. in order to enable that experience. But uh, we really focus on the control of that ride. So we have W2 employee drivers, mm -hmm. which is pretty unique, as I'm sure you and your, your listeners yeah. know. Uh, and we have a dedicated fleet of vehicles, mm -hmm. which means that uh, our drivers always drive our cars. They know they're getting in a clean, safe, well-maintained vehicle, and they know that they're going to be able to provide a, a clean, safe and high quality experience to our customers using our car and, and our technology. And what type of vehicles are you using? Here in Dallas today, we've got a fleet of Buick Enclaves. They're a six passenger midsize SUV. Mm -hmm. uh, as a single fleet type right now, we, we thought it was a great offering because it's it's big enough for a couple couples going out at night, airport trips with yeah. your family, but it's not too big to be uh, you know outrageous for even just one or two passengers. Yeah. It's got captain's chairs, which we think is a really gr big differentiator for our customers. It feels like you're in a kind of private mm -hmm. space and you know, almost like an airline seat when you get in. So it's a big part of, of our experience is the cabin itself. Yeah. So I guess the real question, though, is have you hired Matthew McConaughey as a spokesperson yet? <laughs> And does he do the Buick no, commercials, or, do get... or actually, he does Lincoln? Is it I Buick think he's too? Lincoln, oh, maybe. you know what? Yeah, All right, yeah, I totally botched Buick. that joke. Damn it! <laughs> <laughs> it does. It does act like so. We actually debadge the cars. Mm. Most of our customers don't know their their Buicks. We put our Alto branding okay. uh, on the outside instead of the Buick branding, and um, it, it actually is a lot like the Buick commercials. Yeah. A lot of customers get in and and say. What is yeah. this? And we tell them it's a Buick, and they say, "This is a Buick. It's not my my grandparents' Buick." So interesting. Uh, we sold a lot of Buicks here in Dallas, actually. Nice. I think GM is is excited about that. Well, hopefully, got at least a little affiliate commission. That's sort of where my head first goes. But it, it is interesting. One thing you said that stood out to me is that you're a service company. I think you're not. You didn't say that you're a technology company. You know how Uber and Lyft refer to themselves, and I guess how even others might call themselves a transportation company. I think at the end of the day, though, I'm curious why you think. 
service is so important because I guess in my experience, you know, I think in transportation and mobility generally, it's all about getting one object or a group of objects from A to B and usually for the cheapest price possible. So I'm curious to know how you sort of balance that with, you know, the service aspect of what you're providing, or maybe you're not even trying to compete in that cheapest space. Yeah, we're really not, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, certainly there are people that can, uh, there are companies that can move somebody or something from point A to point B. We actually say exactly that. We can, somebody else can get you from point A to point B cheaper, but nobody else is going to get you from point A to point B as safely, uh, as consistently and in a high quality experience. And we think that that experience from, from point A to point B actually matters mm -hmm. almost as much as, uh, as, as just getting there. And so um, we're, not, we're, not, we're not trying to be a, a solution for everybody. Uh, you know, there's, there's drivers that, that don't want to be employees, yeah. and, and uh, I understand that. Um, but we think there's a subset of, of drivers that appreciate our employee model and the benefits that come with it. There's customers that just want to pay the absolute lowest price. Um, but we see ourselves like a Starbucks. You know, you can get a cheaper cup of coffee mm. Um, a lot of places you can, uh, you know, you can certainly make it at your house cheaper. You can probably go to a gas station and get it cheaper, but people go there because it's the same everywhere you go. That consistency is really important. They have control. You walk in, it smells the same in every Starbucks. You could probably close your eyes and know where the cash yeah. register is going to be and where you're going to pick up your coffee. And people pay a little bit more for that. And we think that the, the same is true in this space. And, and we've actually proved that here in Dallas, that people are willing to pay a little bit more to get that experience. Starbucks is a pretty uh, big brand though, right? I mean, do you see yourself as a niche service, uh, you know, sort of similar to a ride share for kids model, you know, a hop, skip, drive, a Zoom, or even a Wings that focuses, you know, solely on airport trips? Or do you see yourselves as a real competitor to Uber and Lyft in the long run? Yeah, we, we absolutely don't think that it's a niche. We think it's specialized. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when we looked actually, when we were starting the company, and thought about our positioning in the space, we looked at some of those competitors that were kind of more niche mm. and that were uh, actually doing quite well, yeah. right? I mean, with kids or with seniors. And uh, the challenge with those businesses that we found was twofold. One was uh, that in an asset heavy model, which ride, ha ride hailing is, transportation has always yep. been, you know? I mean, Uber likes to say that it's, <laughs> it's uh, asset light, but the reality is, is that, you know, your driver has a vehicle, uh, they're paying for their, their time or, you know, well, in some Uber, way, the company is themselves. asset light. Right. But I think that a lot of the assets and liability and risk are shifted onto the drivers. Sure. The product itself, mm -hmm. ultimately the product is, is an asset heavy business. Yeah. People are big assets and, and cars are big assets. And so, uh, when you're using assets, it's really important to use them as much as possible mm -hmm. because uh, utilization of an asset is a really important metric in, in driving profitability of a business. And so when we looked at some of these niche players, we said, well, we we really like what they're doing and, this, and how they specialize, but in order to utilize our assets fully, in order to employ drivers and be able to make sure that we can pay them and then also make money, we need to be able to, uh, we, we need our service to speak to a bunch of different types of customers. Yeah. So. Um, we built it to be specialized, but not niche. And mm -hmm. so we think about our customer base as attracting many of the same types of customers that some of those specific services do. Yeah. We have a lot of families that use our product, for example, but also just people that are looking for just a, a, a higher end experience, mm -hmm. you know, like trading up um, just because you're going on a date or you're traveling with, you know, a business partner mm -hmm. or, uh, you know, maybe someone else is happening to pay for that ride. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so it, it's it's worth it to you in that in that occasion to spend a little bit more. So we see a lot of our customers are women. Actually, mm -hmm. women are half as likely in the U.S. to be active riders of Uber and Lyft as men. Mm -hmm. And uh, our ridership is actually equally balanced between women and men. Mm -hmm. We get a lot of professionals, women and men, uh, that are doing business trips or commuting for work. And we get a lot of families. Okay. Um, and, and that's that kind of comprises the most of our most of our business. Yeah. And I guess because, you know, the, the way that your business is working, too, I mean, like you said, right, if you're doing if you have employee drivers and you're only doing rides for kids, obviously, there's certain, you know, only a few times of the day where it's going to you're going to see peaks, you know, in the mornings on the way to school and then afternoons on when kids are going home and then nothing late at night. So I guess that hurts your utilization. So was the kind of employee model more of a driver of the market that you were going after, or was the market more of a driver of you guys ending up using employees as drivers? 
it's really the first. I mean, we, we thought in order to offer this product and to offer a differentiated experience, that control of the experience was really important. And so uh, we started with this idea that we needed to have employees because we wanted to be able to select mm-hmm. and vet. Um, but also train and performance manage, provide yeah. standard operating procedures and have you know a set of policies and things that people follow. Yeah. And we're finding you know now that's even more important in today's day and age than it maybe was when we started. Yeah. Um, but but yeah, so it was really a, a thought that in order to solve for the market, we needed to design the business in that way. And then when we when we decided that we had you know employees and, and a fleet, we looked at exactly what you said and said, okay, well, if we just do kids. Yeah. Um, or we just, or we, we just hire a certain type of driver. We might not be able to, uh, you know, if, if you go for only for drivers that, uh, are former police officers yeah. or drivers that have specific childcare experience, you might not be able to scale that part mm-hmm. of the business. Uh, but if we can, we can create these, uh, policies, procedures, technology that wraps around the experience to create a similar level of, of, of differentiation, um, do it with, uh, any, any, you know, any driver, mm-hmm obviously a, a safe and professional driver, but anybody can, can apply and can work for Alto. And then we can keep them busy throughout the day by serving a bunch of different use cases. Then we thought that was a winning, a winning combination. Yeah, and I, I will sort of say that I think that there's definitely something to that. I mean, that's really what my whole business is predicated on and kind of why it exists. It's because the fact that, you know, Uber and Lyft hire basically anyone off the street and drivers aren't trained. You know, I mean, driving for hire is not rocket science, right? Let's be honest, but it's also not the easiest job in the world. So when you have people coming in off the street who aren't trained in customer service or aren't trained in, you know, even safe driving and navigation and using an app and technology, um, you know, there's a lot of education that's lacking. And I think that that's what we've seen. You know, we've had uh, people on my team actually try out taxi driving. And that was one big thing that we heard from the taxi customers that they actually like having a driver who knows the city, who knows how to use navigation really well and mapping and all that versus you know, the guy, the random guy like me who, you know, maybe lives outside of town and just drives into the city on the weekends and doesn't really know what the hell I'm doing. And, you know, it's kind of all over the place. So very interesting to hear about that. And I think from the, you know, sort of business and market perspective, it makes a lot of sense. It's also a great segue into what I really wanted to chat with you about today and kind of how this model that you guys have built, I think, you know, from, you know, what I've seen on the outside and what I'm going to learn today, it seems like it's really allowed you to nimbly pivot. I don't know about pivot is the right term, but kind of adapt at least temporarily to a changing business climate. So let's, uh, I don't think we need to go all the way back to the beginning of coronavirus, but when you started, uh, maybe just sort of highlight like what you started, when you started thinking about like, when was your like, oh shit moment, (laughs) I guess you would say like, hey, (laughs) things are not looking good or hey, we need to start uh, thinking about these things seriously in, in the business specifically. Yeah, it really kind of all started right at the end of February, as we saw, you know, the first number of cases, I think, you know, just a handful mm-hmm. really uh, enter the US, uh, primarily in, in Washington and in California. Um, and, you know, we, there started to be some concern from passengers from drivers mm-hmm. about, you know, what is this going to mean for for me and for rides? And yeah. is this safe? And that's um, when we started really thinking about how important the kind of control and the consistency of our product really was and enabled us to start talking about, you know, our 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 historical differentiators Mm -hmm. of clean and safe rides and really lean into that Mm -hmm. um, in a a differentiated way. Starting at the end of February, early March, we sent our first customer communication and driver communication about the things that we were doing on March 5th. Um, and, and, uh, and, and so we put in a few, a, a few things immediately then really before kind of any cases had happened here in our, our local area in Dallas. But, uh, when we were, you know, focused on making sure that people understood how different we were. So on March 5th, we, um, we let all of our customers know about, you know, our traditional cleaning policies. All of our cars are, uh, cleaned multiple times a day by a dedicated staff yeah. of, of what we call service agents who, clean and, and maintain and keep our cars safe for our drivers and our customers. Uh, at that time, we also uh, ordered and, and started installing HEPA filters, mm-hmm. HEPA air cabin filters in all of our vehicles, which um, are the same kind of air filtration that's in hospitals to keep patients, uh, give patients clean air. Um, and then we just started ramping up from there. As, as we saw more cases, we put in even additional procedures. We, we bought and, and started using EPA registered cleaning products oh, wow. and disinfecting products that have you know, specific EPA uh, approval for, for killing bacteria and viruses. 
Um, we started provisioning all of our vehicles. They've always been provisioned with cleaning supplies mm-hmm. and gloves for our drivers to use in, in trips or after trips. But we started giving drivers enough of gloves and, and their own EPA disinfecting wipes um, to use between trips and on high, high concentrated yeah. touch surfaces. Um, and, and really, that lasted about uh, maybe 10 days, mm-hmm. I would say. <laughs> Uh, on, on March 15th, um, we, the, the world, I think here in Dallas, at least really changed. Mm-hmm. I think, you know, that date is a little bit different by market, but March 15th, uh, we saw a precipitous and very large decline in our ride volume as the local government here started putting in place travel restrictions and, and stay at home orders and closing businesses and all those sorts of things. So on uh, that 15th, the morning of the 15th, we got together as an executive team and uh, we saw that, you know, the day before and that day we were essentially experiencing basically a a 75 to 85 percent decline in our ride volume. From one day to the next? Almost one day to the next. And uh, it was in that moment that we decided, you know, we needed to think about not only how to keep our passengers safe and and clean in their rides, but that we needed to keep them safe and clean at home and be able to get them the things that they need to stay safe at home. And that's when we kind of uh, began pivoting the business really hard towards uh, using a lot of the same procedures and policies that we have, but putting in place deliveries to allow our members to uh, deliver food or goods to our customers that were staying at home. Yeah, Yeah, before we get into the delivery, which I think is really interesting, uh, a few things that you mentioned I think are are pretty interesting. So, you know, first, I guess it's funny, I pulled open the Uber app, uh, the driver app just the other day, I think it was yesterday or this morning, and I saw a bunch of stuff like what you described, you know, sort of like they're now sending that out. And I think one of my biggest criticisms of Uber and Lyft during this whole time is that they're sort of doing a lot of the, the right things. It just seems like they're literally doing them two weeks late. And so when you said that you guys started thinking about this on, what was it, March 5th or something like that, or March 10th, um, I was thinking to myself, wow, that is kind of a huge difference from the bigger companies. Do you think the, and obviously, I don't know, you, this might be just a conjecture or a guess because you're not working there, but do you think the bigger companies just, like, why are they so slow in a situation like this versus you guys were able to identify these things so quickly and say, hey, this might be an issue. Let's start communicating to our drivers. Let's start communicating to our riders. Um, you know about these potential issues and what we're doing about them. I think I think it all kind of stems back to this point of control mm. is the way I think about it. I mean, the, the challenge that the big companies have is not that they can't move fast; they can. I mean, you know, I mean, we've seen Uber and Lyft move really That's quickly true. on, on things, things that, that really matter. <laughs> Yeah, but but they they don't have a lot of control in this situation. Mm-hmm. I mean, I mean, you you mentioned you know before we kind of got into this topic about you know anybody can get on the road and drive and and uh, you know there's a big difference in in you know somebody that just joined and somebody that maybe has been following you for mm-hmm. a while and you know follows your tips and tricks, and I think that's um, that's the challenge that is faced in a marketplace. Right. The, I mean, whether it's Airbnb or or eBay right. or Uber or Lyft, a marketplace doesn't have a lot of control. Mm-hmm. And so it can't have a lot of consistency. And so it's hard to make promises, yeah. quite frankly, because you mm-hmm. don't know that those promises will be delivered on. And therefore, if you make a promise and it's not delivered on, you're actually in a worse case than than if you just said nothing at all. Um, and, and, and so we get a lot of drivers that come in and say, you know, what you're doing isn't rocket science. Mm-hmm. Like I do that all the time. And what I tell <laughs> drivers is that is that you know you you are not the average yeah. right and and even if you're even if you are average there there's people that may be better than you and people that may be worse yeah. than you and what what the the challenge that Uber and Lyft I think the biggest challenge they have in their business is that we say at Alto we're not as good as our last ride uh, or I'm sorry we're not as good as our best ride we're only as good as our last Got ride it. And, and the same is true as, as Starbucks, mm-hmm. right? Like, I mean, if, if you have a great, great driver that does all these things and then you get in a, and the, or, or makes your coffee perfectly and then you go to another Starbucks and it yeah. sucks, you know, you're not going to you're not, not going to trust the brand. Yeah. And I think that's where this kind of marketplace thing has started to break down, especially in the face of something like like coronavirus. Yeah. It's not that they can't that they don't want to move or that they can't move. It's that they, they can't promise it. I mean. These, these cleaning supplies, by the way, we have one person on our team, full-time person, mm-hmm. fully dedicated to sourcing and, and, you know, and buying cleaning oh, supplies wow. for our vehicles and for our drivers. Yeah. They're hard to find. You know? And so if you send a message to customers that here's what all our drivers are doing, and then drivers can't or won't do that right. for whatever reason, 
that's a big that's a big challenge yeah and i mean i mean i guess to be fair to the the bigger companies too i mean imagine some of that challenge is due to scale too right like with cleaning supplies for example right even you guys may be struggling to get uh, you know, cleaning supplies. So if you're doing eight to 10 million rides a day, you can imagine that's probably pretty tough to get cleaning supplies for that too. But um, yeah, no, that, that's definitely uh, some great points, very valid. And, uh, you know, I think that that's sort of, I guess in a time like this, like in the time of, I call it like in the time of Corona, <laughs> um, you know, it sort of highlights how that model breaks down, I guess is the way you put it and sort of how I've been thinking about it. And I guess that I would even say that, you know, before this, I don't know, I feel like most people didn't really care. You know, most people kind of overlook the fact that the product wasn't super consistent because at the end of the day, they just want to get from A to B and you always get from A to B, like 99.999% .99 of the time you do get from A to B. How how you get there and you know the experience along the way is sometimes inconsistent but I guess what matters most um, in a normal environment is just getting to your final destination and you know of course the pricing and the ETAs but those are sort of baked in and so I guess but you guys didn't really have a long period of time where you were able to kind of highlight that because like you said things like you know, it seems like you, if that would have gone on that sort of in-between phase for a while, you might've really been able to distinguish yourselves in that respect. And people would have started thinking about like, Hey, is my driver like actually cleaning this car or not? And I feel like it just shifted yeah. so quickly. Is that kind of what you guys saw? Yeah, exactly. I think that's exactly what we saw is that, you know, I mean, we, we felt like everything that we've been doing mm -hmm. was always important to a segment of customers, yeah. our segment of customers that we were targeting. And, uh, but that, you know, uh, we saw at the end of February and into early March, it was becoming more important to a larger and larger segment of customers. Yeah. And then all of a sudden nobody was ready. <laughs> and so those things that, you know, and, and, and by the way, we still do some rides a day okay. and, and, it, and, and for those people that need to move, uh, you know, basic nurses, doctors, healthcare workers, or, or others that are getting to other essential businesses, we think we offer a really great product for them and a great product for our, our drivers. Yeah. We're trying to keep them. I mean, this is an inherently unsafe activity for them too. And so we're doing everything we can to protect them, uh, who really are our employees are our first priority. Yeah. And then our customers are, you know, a, a second, very close uh, priority after that. And, and so, um, yeah, but our, our, our ability to differentiate on the ride basis on, on coronavirus, mm -hmm. I would say, um, and kind of leverage that, uh, well, one, maybe that wouldn't have been a good business practice anyway. Like, I'm not sure that we would have wanted to like lean into fear. Um, yeah. but you know, nonetheless, it, it didn't present itself right. in that way because, uh, we saw that we saw that ride volume just really toppled, uh, anyway. Okay. Yeah. And so I think we've teased it enough and now we can kind of talk about what you guys are up to now and sort of how, uh, I'm really curious to learn like what the business is looking like today and we don't have to go into all the details, but at a, at a high level, like what does the business look like today? You know, we're recording here on March 26th. I'm going to release this episode in a few days. So hopefully nothing crazy happens in between that time but uh i'm sure well this is this is that's that's the thing the thing of this these times right i mean we are in a in a phase of our world where uh this problem that we're facing that, that's first a hum, human mm -hmm. problem you know uh, is uh doubling every four days yeah. right now so by the time our, you know people are listening to this we'll be in a much different world than, yeah. than the one that we're uh, talking right, today, well i'll try to frankly, post it but, sooner then <laughs> <laughs> But but I mean that that's the reality. Yeah. I mean, and uh, both for humans, but also for our business, mm -hmm. it's a business crisis as well. And so we are uh, adapting extremely quickly. Like I like I mentioned before, I mean, we think that the things that we're doing to differentiate on rides are equally important now mm -hmm. to differentiate for deliveries. The fact that our customers know that our employees yeah. are taken care of, that they are they have sick time. We just implemented. They've always had sick time, paid sick leave. Uh, but we, you know, based on the guidance of the federal government that just came out on the 18th and we implemented on the 20th, we now have a corona, uh, coronavirus emergency sick leave. All of our drivers have up to 14 days of additional paid sick leave to use in case they're directly impacted or someone in their family is directly impacted by the virus. Uh, we've also implemented emergency family leave for any of our drivers that have children that may uh, be impacted because their schools are out. And so I think first and foremost, you should know that the, you know, what we want our customers to know is that our product is really differentiated mm -hmm. before, but it's even more differentiated now. We know that we're not going to have people getting in the car with your things or you as a customer if they're mm -hmm. sick. They have no reason to make that trade off of coming to work to earn 
opportunity for it to take care of their family versus taking care of themselves and, and make, taking care of the community. Yeah. Ultimately, we don't want anybody working that's sick. So that's number one. The number two is, you know, we are able to use all those same processes that we put in place to keep the cars clean mm -hmm. and safe for our customers before now for their things. You know, all of these EPA products and everything that we're using, the gloves, standard operating procedures, our drivers follow those to a T. Mm -hmm. We've trained them over time to do that and we're able to roll those things out. So when we pick up food now, a driver uses a clean pair of gloves to go into the restaurant and pick up the food. Mm -hmm. But they put the food in the car, they take off the gloves, we discard those, and they drive to the customer's house. They open the car to the door, they put on a clean set of gloves, they take the food, and they leave it on the customer's uh, porch. Yeah. We're even looking at the ways in which we can provide drivers with ways to disinfect the packaging mm -hmm. after they drop the package. So it's that sort of like level of precision, I would say, control and consistency in delivery that we think you know, is, is just as important as it is in rides. Yeah. Uh, maybe even more so now. Yeah. Well, I definitely commend you guys because it sounds like you're, you know, I guess from a driver's perspective, taking amazing care of your drivers. So I'm sure that they are very appreciative in that. And me as someone who likes drivers too, I'm also appreciative of that. But I guess in general too, I mean, do you think people care as much though? You know, I mean, one of the things because we've been telling drivers is in this time with rideshare demand way down, you know, switch to delivery. Or if you're worried about getting sick from driving, you know, switch to delivery because there is so much less human contact or, you know, obviously I'm not a doctor, but I mean, like, it doesn't take a genius to realize, like, sitting in a car three feet away from someone for 10, 20, 30 minutes at a time is probably not the best idea when there's a virus spreading around versus doing food delivery where, you know, you're in your car 90% of the time, you get out, you walk into a restaurant, some ideally the food is sitting there waiting on the counter for you you grab it you put it on your seat and then you drop you know now all the food delivery apps for example are um you know just allowing people to leave it touchless. yeah touchless yeah. is what yeah you're right that's what they call it and so you may actually never even see see anyone on that probably not a whole shift but you know on a few deliveries here and there yeah and you know i mean i think again this is where we're trying to be ahead of this game because of the world is changing so quickly so obviously touchless is a great way to kind of enable that but we looked at how companies in china mm. were dealing with deliveries you know months ago and actually what we found there was that a lot of the things that you know i think we sit as we sit here today may actually seem crazy yeah. uh, are very likely to not seem crazy in four or eight mm. or you know 16 days um, in China, companies that were doing food delivery were having every person that interacted with a food order take their temperature at the time that they touched that oh, order wow. and record that digitally on a receipt that went to the customer. Wow. So you knew that the person that cooked your food, that packed your food, that picked up your food and delivered your food were all hmm. not sick. Yeah. And this, I mean, and, and, and I don't want to, you know, again, I'm not, I'm not saying that we are necessarily going to get yeah. there. But we're trying to really hold a different level of standard that we think a lot of customers can and should care about, and a lot of drivers can and should care about, right? I mean, changing gloves, th this virus can spread in other ways besides um, human to human contact. And so what, what uh, we're seeing in the market today is that our restaurant partners are choosing us over others mm -hmm. that are cheaper, no doubt. Uh, because we can promise to their customers that we're holding a higher duty of care and keeping their customers safe. And uh, the customers are choosing us and, and asking restaurants to use us because they're expecting that higher duty yeah. of care. And again, that, that consistency and control is just really important in doing yeah, that. Yeah, no, and I think that's actually a great answer because I, I will be honest, you know, when you described all that to me, it seemed like a little over the top to me, but I like that idea of looking to China and saying that, hey, you know, even though this maybe isn't what people care about now, it's like this huge country has already experienced all of this. And I've sort of used that too to so, sort of predict, you know, tell drivers, okay, we saw in China, for example, that food delivery got really big. Obviously, if everyone's still quarantined, they may not go to the bars, but they still have to eat, right? So you can kind of spot or highlight these opportunities from studying other markets. And so that's really smart and interesting to hear so that, you know, if things do get worse, and hopefully they won't, but if they do, you guys are going to be well ahead of the curve and only differentiate yourselves further uh, with your partners or whoever you're working with. I am curious how you were able to kind of on the BD side, you know, on the partnership business development side, how are you able to, you know, start like basically pivot to a delivery company so quickly? I think in a, some of the tweets that you were putting out, I saw, you know, you were working with everything from, it sounded like from restaurants to even uh, medical supplies or uh, prescriptions. Yep. And so I'm curious how you so quickly, you know, got them onboarded or into your system or how does that look from like the business, you know, inner working side? 
Yeah, I mean, I would just say that I'm really proud of our team for the, the movements that we've been able to make in the last 10 mm -hmm. days since that March 15th kind of decision. How many people do we you guys have on the team? We've got 25 people on our marketing, sales, tech, and uh, operations leadership front. Mm -hmm. We've got about 120 drivers on staff. And so uh, that whole kind of central team, yeah. our headquarters team, uh, has, has essentially you know been working around the clock for the last 10 days to uh, pivot our product offering to you know to change the way we market we've entirely we've entirely updated our website yeah, to focus on deliveries <laughs> of things that we differentiate um you know a lot frankly a lot of these things are thing you know we, we've probably made more changes to our business in the last 10 days than than we did in 10 months mm. before that um you know i mean i don't know if that was because we things were going well right yeah. we were growing and the ride business was working uh but under this kind of uh new world we're living in i, I think we've we've been really successful in kind of galvanizing the team and, and moving quickly to survive yeah. i mean I, I guess that's that's probably what happens when you're in survival mode yeah. uh, which we are i mean just to be fully transparent right i mean we're a startup yep. the, the capital markets are are very <laughs> uncertain um, our ride volume has has declined dramatically. We were actually profitable on a gross margin basis, hmm. and so we hadn't built in like losing a bunch of money yeah. into our road <laughs> for a while. So, uh... so this is uh, this is kind of an existential threat to our existence, and I think that that we're taking it seriously yeah. and and uh, and moving really quickly to change how we do. Yeah. So I guess unlike Uber, when your ride volume goes down, you guys actually lose money, huh? <laughs> I think they actually make yeah, money, right? When they're riding, I mean, I mean, yeah, down. That, yeah. If you if you if you if you make money on each ride, and then and then they go away, we lose more money, and and that's part of employing drivers, yeah. right? I mean, uh, I I think I tweeted uh, something you know at you the other day around this you know this bailout that's coming, yeah. and obviously I care about drivers, and and I want uh, gig workers to be covered by these things, but you know ultimately now you know the entire economy, our entire you know society is essentially bailing out Uber by paying. You know yeah. those drivers uh, that that you know I'm paying my drivers today, and 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 we're not doing a lot of rides, yeah. uh, and so and so you know that's that's the kind of kind of cost of doing business that I think is also actually hopefully is going to be a big thing that we talk about coming out of this around the employment model again. I know it was already a big topic of discussion, but I think I think this is going to really change the way people generally think about the safeties and securities of employment and and the trade offs between you know what what you know, seems like a, a great opportunity versus, you know, what protects you in course in, in the case of a downside scenario. Yeah, no, I mean, I think this situation really does highlight some of the, I mean, I guess downsides, right, of the independent contractor model and what Uber is doing with drivers. And I would even say, you know, a lot of the drivers that I think love or, you know, kind of say they want to stay independent because of the flexibility are the same ones right now, you know, like rightfully so complaining about the fact that they don't have money, that they don't have sick pay and all of those items, literally all of those items items would be addressed by <laughs> being an employee. So it is, it will be interesting. I don't know. I, I'm curious to know what you think, because I haven't seen as much pushback yet as I would have, maybe not thought, but you know, I just haven't seen that much pushback from the fact that like what you just described, like Uber has basically, you know, hired all these workers as independent contractors. And now they're asking for the government to bail them out because they didn't pay them like employees. Right. I don't think I've seen anyone put it as succinctly as that. And not that many people kind of recognize that, but maybe that's something that will be talked about once this is all over. What do you think? I hope so. I mean, you know, I, I, I mean, I think that this is a really important topic mm -hmm. and, you know, quite frankly, I think in some ways, unfortunately, Uber is going to be rewarded for their behavior, yeah. right? I mean, they're gonna they're gonna not have to spend as much money as ride volume goes down. They came out and said that you know even as rides decline, they're going to spend less, and so they're going to have four billion dollars in the bank at the end of the year. We're definitely not going <laughs> to have anywhere close to that, Delta, just to be clear. Um, and they're going to be rewarded by investors, mm -hmm. you know, because investors, as soon as they said that, said, okay, we'll keep buying. Um, and and you know, I don't know that that's actually the right decision for our economy as a whole for you know our our, our society as a whole yeah. um and i and i hope that we'll have a, a a rigorous debate about what does make sense and and how you know companies should have to pay for the you know the the true cost of doing business and frankly consumers do yeah. i mean you you, you I, I think you know you made a good point consumers obviously want to get from point a to point b as cheaply as possible uh, Uber's been subsidizing that. So, you know, and, and now the public markets are subsidizing that. And now maybe all of us are subsidizing that. So it was maybe all fun and games, you know, while it was VC money and we were all getting, mm -hmm. you know, $3 rides. Uh, but I think 
maybe we need to go back and recalculate the true cost of each of those rides and think about, you know, what are we really paying, you know, yeah. uh, after it's all said and done, maybe in a, in, you know, three years later, we're going to, we're going to pay for that $3. Yeah. Ride. And I think this situation that we're in right now with coronavirus is bringing to the surface, a lot of these important issues. And maybe, you know, it's not the best time to get into a lengthy debate. You know, I don't think there's going to be a huge debate over some of these topics right now. Cause like you said, everyone is more focused. Now we just take care of, right. People. Just take care yeah. of people right now. But I do think there's going to be, you know, maybe a reckoning or at least a lot of questions. You know, I, I think it's like the typical, you know, in government when something really bad happens, like after there's like all these hearings and investigations and reports. And I feel like, <laughs> That could be coming. So I, I think everyone wishes this will be over sooner rather than later. But I guess, uh, you know, to kind of close things out, uh, what are you guys thinking about right now with the business or kind of going forward? Um, what, do you, what do you need to uh, consider? Yeah, well, we just think, I mean, I totally agree. Right now, it's all just about, you know, taking care of the present. But but we do think that this is going to galvanize people's behaviors, mm -hmm. uh, change the way people think about um you know what what they value and how they behave over time yeah. and should we be able to survive this which is you know uh uncertain as a as a company for sure but uh, uh you know it should we be able to survive it we think that the values that we hold true um on multiple fronts whether it's for our consumers about safe and clean and consistent experiences or for our drivers about consistency and safety for them uh, we think that those are going to be more important tomorrow than they are today, uh, than they are than they were yesterday. Yeah. And so uh, we we hope that that will continue to be part of that debate um, and of that discussion as we as we get out of this over time. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, I really appreciate you coming on. I know uh, you're working on a lot of things, but I'm glad you were ta able to take some time out of your busy day and come, uh, I guess, educate us and also, but just highlight, like, I think everything that you guys are up to, I think from a sort of, you know, rideshare business perspective, what you guys are doing is really interesting and just taking care of drivers and also just from a sort of pure startup business aspect, I think how you guys have pivoted to delivery so quickly is also uh, very commendable and impressive. So I appreciate it, Will. If people want to learn a little bit more about Alto, where should they go? Where can they reach you? I know you're a big Twitter guy, so I'll feel free to let you share whatever yeah, you want to share. Find me on Twitter. <laughs> I, my, my team allows me to say whatever I want on Twitter because I only have like 150 followers. But uh, well, I think we can probably get you at least a couple more. <laughs> um, our website's www.ridealto.com. Or if you're a driver and want to and want to uh, work for us, uh, we'd love to have you apply. It's drivealto.com. Um, and you can find us in the app store at uh, Ride Alto there. As Very well. cool. Are you guys hiring drivers right now? We're not hiring just yet. I mean, the delivery business is, uh, is I, I mean, I would say we're pretty excited about mm -hmm. the progress we've made. We're still not out of the woods yet. The delivery business is growing faster mm -hmm. today than our original ride rides business grew when we launched. Um, and so we've got a long way to yeah. go. Uh, and we have a lot more drivers on staff than we did when we launched. And so we need to build out of that. But uh, we're really hopeful that in the next few weeks, as we continue to see this business uh, flourish, that we'll be in a position to, to bring on more drivers. Very cool. Well, wish you all the best.